Oh, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's good enough for me. What do you think of when you think of old time religion? Here's what I think of. Right off the bat, I think of a white wood frame church building back in the woods, <coughs> surrounded by trees, horses, carriages, parked. The windows are open because no well, you don't have air conditioning. The wind is wafting through the building and you can hear the sound of singing coming from inside the building as the members there are worshiping God. Wish you could go back to those old days? No. <laughs> you know, most of the time, whenever people think of the old time religion, they think of, of mom and dad's religion. They think of grandma and grandpa's religion. They think of their immediate people's religion. But you know, in religion, the, in, in, in reality, the old time religion that we need to be copying and following is way older than our immediate ancestors. If we want to go back to the old time religion, we've got to go way back 2,000 years to the first century. And note that it was there where there were men who were inspired of God, who were speaking words given them by the Heavenly Father Himself. So you know there was no error, no mistake in that which they were saying. Being led in the exact way that God wanted people to be saved and that He wanted people to worship Him. Whenever a person becomes a Christian today, you know we automatically have a hunger for the Word of God. We want to know what the Word of God says. We want to learn everything that we can learn that is in between the pages of Genesis and Revelation. And so very often whenever a person wants to begin studying the Bible, you know what book they'll go to? I always wonder what the book of Revelation is teaching. I think I'll read it. Uh, I'll tell you what, the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book. It has signs and imagery and it has words that were designed specifically for Christians of the first century who were being persecuted by the government of Rome. Now, I admit, interesting study, if you've got several years of study under your belt to where you can understand what the book of Revelation is saying. In reality, a new Christian wanting to learn how to serve God today with a, with a limited knowledge of the Bible needs to go to the book of Acts. There in that book, we can read of the beginning of the church. We can read about how Christians treated one another and how they treated other people. We can learn what people did in order to be saved, in order to become Christians. A new Christian can learn more of how to please God from the book of Acts than from the book of Revelation. Now, once you've grown up in Christ, then the book of Revelation, yeah, jump right in there and learn it. The, the living. It can wait until you've grown in Christ. Well, our lesson title this morning is Then and Now. So let's think about that biblical idea of then and and now, often as we think of then, we're going to be thinking about Old Testament times. Way back then. The times when the nation of Israel was being led and guided by the law of Moses. The law that was given through Moses on that great Mount Sinai located on the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. The laws given there by God through Moses were intended to guide that nation of Israel for some 1,300 years until Christ would come. Then that New Testament law went into effect. 
It's a shame that some people today still want to be guided to that old Paul. That's what we're talking about on Wednesday evening in our class. When Paul writes to the Galatians, he tells them, why would you want to be under bondage of that old law? You've got a new law. In fact, he calls that old law a schoolmaster. Remember? The purpose of the schoolmaster was to get the child from where they were to where they were supposed to be. And he says that Old Testament law was, was our schoolmaster. Its job was to get us from back there in the days of Moses and the Israelites to the days of Jesus Christ. Well, some people want to be guided by that old law. I want us to look at some of that, some of those old laws and see if we really want to be guided by them. Many of our religious friends will tell us that the Old Testament laws were divided into three parts. There were ceremonial laws that God instructed Israel to keep. Laws pertaining to the worship of God. Sacrifices that were to be made during that period of time. Whether it was a sacrifice of grain or a sacrifice of a turtle dove or a sacrifice of a, of, of a, of a one year lamb that was perfect and without blemish or the sacrifice of an oxen. God gave laws pertaining to those things and they're a part of the ceremonial laws. He told them about the Passover and what they were to do during the Passover and Pentecost and the other times during the year when special uh, sacrifices were to be made. Well, secondly, there's civil laws, they tell us. These laws dealt with the daily living of the Israelites. What you could eat and what you weren't allowed to eat. We know that they had laws that we don't have today concerning dietary. You know, if we was living under the old laws, we, we couldn't have had those hot dogs yesterday. Pork wasn't allowed. They some pork in those hot dogs. Now what else is in them, we don't know, but there's some pork in those hot dogs. Those civil laws also had to do with, with how did you repay somebody if you had harmed them? Or if you had harmed their servant? Or if you had harmed their animal? Or, or what if you accidentally killed somebody? Well, the civil laws took care of that and told you what you were allowed to do. Well, then finally there were what our friends say were the moral laws. Like the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt. Things that had to do with morality. That's the part that a lot of our denominational friends say we still are to keep. You don't have to keep, they say, the ceremonial laws. Don't have to keep the civil law, but you got to keep those moral laws like the Ten Commandments. Well, one of those commands that was found in that moral law is found in Exodus 28 through 10, as given to Moses while that servant of God was on Mount Sinai, receiving from God his laws. And, and here's what that law said Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now, anybody know how, what hours the Sabbath day ran from? Friday night at 6 o'clock to Saturday night at 6 o'clock. That was the Sabbath day. Friday night at 6 o'clock to Saturday night at 6 o'clock. You know, if we were bound to that law today, anybody that worked from Friday night at 6 o'clock to Saturday night at 6 o'clock would be in direct violation of the law that God gave to the Old Testament Israelites. According to Exodus 35, verses 2 and 3, you couldn't even light a fire during that time. So if you were going to eat, you had to have food that had been prepared prior to Friday night at 6 o'clock to Saturday night at 6 o'clock. You were not allowed to travel more than seven-tenths of a mile under that Sabbath law. Well, that was a Sabbath day's journey. 
But almost all who propose that we that we're still under the Sabbath day law violate that law by traveling and cooking and working during the hours from Friday at six to Saturday at six. Sabbath ain't Sunday. We know that because the Bible tells us that. Matthew 28, verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Sunday is the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. The Sabbath was ending. The glorious first day of the week when our Lord overcame death and rose out of that tomb was beginning. They're not the same. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now let's be practical. If something is fulfilled, how much bearing or control does it have over people anymore? You go to the bank to borrow money. You borrow money. They give you the money. And along with the money, they give you something else. Oh, that little payment book. Or that big... Big payment book. Once you've paid all the bills, whether it be four years or ten years or thirty years for a home, once that book has been in, it has been fulfilled, hasn't it? How much bearing does that loan have on you anymore? Zero. No more. You don't have to pay anything else. You've fulfilled your obligation. Your debt has been fulfilled and that debt is no longer binding over you. Listen, Christ came to fulfill what do you say? The law. The Old Testament law. Christ came to fulfill it. Well, when He fulfilled it, how much bearing does that law have over mankind now? None. It's been fulfilled. Just like that debt that you paid to the bank. The debt has been fulfilled. You no longer owe. Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law. It's no longer binding over mankind. While we're talking about Old Testament and the laws, I will mention one more thing. In the book of Leviticus chapter 19, we read of some of the laws given to the nation of Israel by the Almighty, which were a part of those Old Testament commands. Among those commands in this chapter, he says, I want you to keep the Sabbath. I want you to honor your parents. I want you to stay away from idols. I want you to leave the corner of your fields unharvested. Why? So people that didn't have anything could go in those fields and glean, get food, get food to eat. Whether if it was a field of wheat or whether if it was your grapes, you didn't pick everything, you left some. That was a law of God so that those who didn't have could go in and have something to eat. Don't steal, he says in that chapter. Don't lie. Don't profane the name of God. Here's a good one. God said in the Old Testament, if somebody works for you, how often do you have to pay him? Pay him every day. If he works today, you pay him today. That's Old Testament law. If you didn't do that according to the Old Testament, you were in violation of the law of God. That's Old Testament. But how much bearing does it have on us today? None. Right? Because Christ has fulfilled the law. But I want us to notice verse 28 of this chapter. Verse 28 says this, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh from the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, Many people think he's talking about tattoos when he, when he talks about print any marks upon you. Like me. That might be exactly what he was talking about. Those who think we're still under the law of Moses say you can't have tattoos. We've been studying on Wednesday evenings from the book of Galatians. In that New Testament book, again, Paul refers to that old law as a schoolmaster. But then he writes in Galatians 3.25, he says, but after that faith has come, after that faith has come, faith in Christ. 
After the faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. We're not under that Old Testament law. And I'm glad we're not under that Old Testament law. Not controlled by, not under the bidding of the old law of Moses. So, just as man is no longer under the law of the Sabbath, not working on Saturday, not cooking on Saturday, so man is no longer under the law that said don't have tattoos. That's an example of then and now. But what about tattoos? Boils down to this. You want one, it's up to you. You don't want one, it's up to you. It's up to you. The Apostle Paul, the inspired Apostle Paul, while writing to the congregation of Lord's Church of Corinth, gives us today a great example of this idea of then and now. Now, this is New Testament. So it applies to us. This does apply to us. Let's notice what he says. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven? kingdom of God, be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Parents, cover your kids' ears. Four of these things that Paul has mentioned deal with SEX. Don't they? They do. Fornication, sex outside of marriage, adultery. When somebody who's married has relations with somebody that he's not, he or she is not married to. Effeminate and abusers of themselves of mankind deal with homosexuality. In a homosexual relationship, one takes the leading role, the other the subservient role. The effeminate one describes the one who's subservient to the other. Other sins are mentioned. Paul says that's what you used to be. That was then. Let's notice what now is in verse 11. Such were some of you, but you're washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, what an example of then and now. You were steeped in sins then. You were unfit for the kingdom of God then. But now, you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified. I wonder how they were washed. Let's go back to an example that most of us know about. Saul of Tarsus became the great apostle Paul. Before he was known as Paul, he was known as Saul. He was endeavoring to eradicate the very name of Jesus from the face of the earth. He began that great persecution in the city of Jerusalem. Many Christians had to flee the city for their safety. He even went to the point of going to the high priest and getting letters from the high priest and then traveling towards Damascus, Syria. And this letter gave him the authorization that if he found any Christians on the road to Damascus or in Damascus, he could have them arrested and sent back to Jerusalem so they could be tried for heresy by the Jewish Sanhedrin. Well, while on that road to Damascus, very near the city itself, Saul is blinded by that bright light sent from heaven, and he hears a voice that says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks that question, Who art thou, Lord? The response he got would have struck him to the very core. Acts 9 5, Saul hears that voice say, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Saul, then, knowing of his great mistake, asked the voice he heard the question. He said, Lord, what would you have me do? And then in verse 6, we find out what Saul was told to do. Arise and go into the city, and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. So being led to the hand of the child, Saul is taken to the city of Damascus. In Damascus, there was a, a disciple of the Lord, a Christian. A Christian is a disciple of the Lord. His name was Ananias. 
And the Lord sent this man Ananias to Saul to tell him what he must do. You remember what he told him, don't you? Later on in his life, this man Saul, now called Paul, while in the city of Jerusalem, told others of his conversion, of that bright light that came down, of the voice that said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? He heard that voice say, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Go into the city of Damascus, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He was telling folks about that. He said, here's what that preacher told me I had to do. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Ananias the preacher told him, Now why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul was washed of his sins by being baptized. You remember the Bible told us that the Corinthians who had been so involved in sin that they were now washed. How do you reckon they were washed? Well, the same way that Saul of Tarsus was. They were baptized and that washed away their sins. Lost before, saved after, then and now. Where do you stand today? Listen, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what sins you've committed in the past. They're forgivable. Amen. Make today your then and now day. Then you were lost. You were not a Christian. You were unsaved. Now you can respond to the invitation of Christ. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. You can have those sins washed away. You can leave this building saved, a child of God. The invitation is yours. If you're subject to it, those of you at home, if you're subject to it, you call me after services. Those of you who are here, if you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Oh.